I'm Steve Stein, and you're listening to Inside Asia, conversation with Asia's leading movers, shakers, thinkers, and provocateurs. In this episode, my guest is Frank Lavin, a former U.S. ambassador to Singapore and a senior executive of Citibank and Bank of America. We talked about his newest venture, Export Now, which turns a popular misconception about U.S.-China trade on its ear. Instead of looking for profits and exports from China, Lavin's newest venture is all about helping companies import goods into China. I spoke to him on the 62nd floor of Singapore's Tower Club, boasting some of the best views in the city. We sat in the pillared halls of the club's majestic foyer and talked about e-commerce in China and the kind of opportunities that presents. It's a pleasure to have you here, Frank, today. We're on the 62nd floor uh, at the Tower Club in Singapore, which is, if I'm not mistaken, the dining place of the elite, which leads me to ask you, what brings you here? <laughs> Steve, great to be with you. It's always fun to catch up. It's great to talk about Asia and China and Singapore. And uh, the Tower Club's a great place. It's the Tower Club, I'll say this, has the best view in Singapore. So if you want to look at the harbor, if you want to look at Marina Bay Sands, it's a great place to come. I'm not sure I properly fit in here, but please don't tell the management this is where we are. Well, speaking of stargazing, let's talk a little bit about your business. Yeah. I mean, you've uh, created a pretty unique idea where uh, China has been known for a major export uh, uh, provider. And uh, in fact, they've generated and created an extraordinary uh, effect over many years. But now uh, your business is focused on importing, bringing products, overseas products into China. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Look, China has the biggest retail market in the world. It's GDP. It's overall economy is still smaller than that of the United States, but but on the, the consumer sector is larger. And the locomotive of that is e-commerce, meaning it's got the largest e-commerce channel in the world, too. Alibaba, the main China platform, is bigger than Amazon and eBay combined. So it's this massive e-commerce machine in China. What our company does, Export Now, we help U.S. and other international brands sell on these China platforms because typically the U.S. merchant, the U.S. brand owner, won't have those China capabilities. So we'll bring the product into market. We'll do all the testing, regulatory approval, labeling requirements, to sell food or apparel, make sure it's it's all proper. Uh, we'll run the store operations, capture the transaction, do all the financial settlement, and then remit U.S. dollars back to the merchant back in the U.S. So any U.S. brand can now sell in China through e-commerce, and they never have to actually hire a China team. We're the outsource provider that solves that problem for them. And, and China is exploding when it comes to e-commerce. A lot of people in the U.S. and elsewhere aren't aware of this. Um, uh, extraordinary numbers coming in. Uh, over 50 percent of retail sales, I understand, are occurring online. Is that accurate? Well, I'd, probably 50 percent in sub-segments. If you look at things like apparel and cosmetics, those tend to be uh, skew younger, skew female and skewed heavily toward e-commerce. If you look toward other items like uh, household durables or um, food, you're not going to get 50%. But if you look at, say, people under 40, they're, they're spending 50% of their retail spend on e-commerce. I understand it was projected uh, at $1.6 trillion, uh, it, it, and, and then over 40% of total global e-commerce spend came from China in 2015. Um, in, in one day alone, a singles day, which maybe you could tell us a little yeah. bit about, uh, there was four. $14.3 billion spent uh, online in well, that, that single day. That was last year. 14.3 yeah. was last year. This year was 17.8 or something. This year was up. So we said if that singles day was a country, if it was just an e-commerce e all that day was it w was stacked it up against what countries around the world sell on e-commerce, it would be the 11th largest country in the world, just behind South Korea, just ahead of Brazil, just what takes place in that one day, right? So it's this massive, massive uh, consumer culture in China. And here, here's a point about China that we that drives this. China doesn't have a offline distribution system that's mature the way it is in the U.S. or in Europe and Japan and so forth, meaning there's just not the, the, the branded retailers, there's not the shopping malls, there's not the big box stores uh, because of their own economic development. So e-commerce is actually a preferred channel in China. The e-commerce gives you better uh, integrity, better consumer choice, better information, and, and you don't have the IP problems, meaning just to one example, Tmall, the main Alibaba platform, Tmall only lets merchants sell if they are the brand owner or authorized agent. 
region. So if you go to the Nike store on Tmall, you're talking to Nike. Whereas if you go around the corner to corner shop and see something in a Nike box, you can't be 100% sure if it is Nike or if it's not Nike. So that's uh, actually created a bit of a conundrum for those who have early uh, early on invested in China in their own high street retail outlets. Uh, now, if you walk up and down uh, the streets of Shanghai, you see young shoppers going in, checking their mobile phones, taking snapshots of, of the brand and, and, and of the make and model, stepping outside and then making an online purchase. I mean, it's actually unfolding, uh, is what I'm told, in terms of the, the traditional retailer. Yeah, I, I think there's downward pressure for the offline retailers in China because the market is shifting online. They still need arguably those offline locales, but you're right, they're more sort of billboards. They're, they're signage and they're enticements and so forth, but it's not where the transaction takes place. I'll make another comment, Steve. China is uh, going down the same path the U.S. is going to go down, but China's ahead of the U.S., meaning we're going to see the same dynamic unfold. Online just gives you better pricing, better selection, and better information. If you go to the multi-brand retailer and you ask the clerk about which smartphone you should buy and how many pixels are in the camera, the odds are that, you know, good local U.S. sales clerk won't know that you can go online. If you're serious about photography with your smartphone, you can say, I want the smartphone that has the best pixels, the best aperture, and so forth. And you can find out right away, here's how they're rated, here's how they're reviewed, here's the check mark, and you, you can make a decision online better than going to the store. So we're not talking about just another channel. We're talking about the future channel. I mean, the, the emphasis and the momentum <coughs> is so powerful right now in China. Where do you anticipate it going? Well, I, I think you're right. It's going. It's it's a better channel for most transactions. And you almost ask the question, Steve, in the opposite. You almost say, well, what kind of items require a physical display and physical interaction? Because anything that doesn't meet some threshold in that set of questions is just better off online. But there are some products that require, at least for some part of the constituency, anything that has complicated series of steps or it has to be demonstrated. Fine. There's room. There's need for a showroom. Uh, so that's going to anything very, very high end, high end jewelry, luxury automobiles. Those tend to people want to touch and feel and see the activity. So there's still going to be segments that are slow to adapt or have long term sort of offline horizons. But for the most part, I think you're going to see apparel, cosmetics, household goods, personal electronics, toys, uh, furniture and so forth move rapidly online. So we're seeing two kind of uh, interesting events. China has been going through double-digit growth from year on year. It's starting to slow. Uh, and as that slows, uh, the pressure is on to start to pick up consumer buying. The government's trying to stimulate consumer spend. I understand that consumer saving rates are still at the range of 35 to 40 percent compared to 5 to 6 percent in the United States. Um, how do you get them to spend? And, and is this kind of push in e-commerce going to release the dragon, if you will? Well, I, look. Consumer spending has outperformed GDP growth for a number of years as you have these waves of Chinese every year hit middle income status. For the first time in their life, they have disposable income or they have significant. They've been sort of toiling in middle income status. Now they finally can. So the first time in life, you can buy a pair of Levi's. You can buy a bottle of wine. You can go to the theater, with buy some movie tickets. So you can just enjoy life a little bit better. So that that is going to outperform some time. I know the numbers from 2015. 2015, GDP grew about 7%. Consumer spending grew about 30%. So it just shows you that, that you know, human nature being such as it is, you know, you're, you're grinding away in your job and you finally have some money to spend. Well, you are going to want to spend it. So why, why life is to enjoy. So th that impulse is there. These are the kind of statistics that make, uh, you know, more traditional developed markets drool. I mean, looking at some of the, these numbers and some of the momentum around consumer spend. Uh, bring me back a little bit to your business and, and uh, uh, are you appealing primarily to U.S.-based branded companies that are late to the China market and no, therefore looking for a way in? They're not. They're not necessarily late, but they're they're typically companies that might be uh, more mid-tier, so they don't necessarily have a huge Chinese footprint or any Chinese footprint. Say, think of this. Say, think of your a five hundred million dollar company or a billion dollar company. That's a good sized company. That's a very successful company, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have great global capabilities. And China being remote and challenging and significant cultural 
language gaps. Even a billion dollar company is unlikely to have huge China capabilities. So we can really help that company. You have a good brand, a good model, people love the product, but there's no on the ground execution capability. Well, we can do all of that for you. We can get you into that market. As you point out, it might be 30, 40, 50% of the retail market might be online. So we can do that for you in a few weeks or a few months. All of a sudden you're in the game. Uh, and this is one of the uh, challenges that people always come in and out of China saying it's just the challenge of making it work in China sometimes outstrip the desire. So so at, at some point, are you trying to ease the wave for people otherwise have failed or feel like they may fail? Well, no, but you put your finger, I don't think it's a failure point. It's a cost benefit point. Meaning if somebody says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a billion dollar company. I'm making some kind of specialty product that's popular in the U.S. that might not be as popular in China. And then there's purchasing power issues. There's cultural gaps and so forth. Uh, maybe my entire entire China market is only $5 million. That billion dollar U.S. company is not going to put a team into Shanghai to chase $5 million in sales. So, so you have market failure. There's real demand there, real potential, but there's just it's not worth the commitment from the company to go find it. So we, we can fill that gap. We can say, listen, we'll get you that $5 million by just going online and running a whole e-commerce store, and that requires no personnel on the ground. We'll basically replicate your U.S. e-commerce store for you, execute that in China. You stay home, we'll do the work. Let's pull back a little bit. I mean, what in the world drew you to China to begin with? I mean, look at the the, the chaos, the complexity, the, the opaqueness. Is this speak to your nature? But isn't I mean, that, that, I'm, that I'm chaotic and opaque. No, listen, uh, <laughs> Uh, but that is the appeal, isn't it? To say, you know, there's there's a lot of charm in China. We know in day-to-day -day business, it can be frustrating, it can be challenging, bad things can happen. But we also know there's an enormous amount of potential in China, a lot of good news there, too. The market is booming. Americans make terrific products that the Chinese really like. And there's this extraordinary journey through Chinese history and Chinese culture that's accessible to foreigners if you make that commitment, if you study it and read it. So I first got involved as an undergraduate at uh, Georgetown, uh, taking the language, taking the history courses. And and it's been a lifelong journey for me. And, and, but, and, and, and along the way, you've seen it and entered in diplomatically, uh, commercially, financially. You've had so many different engagements, uh, even during, uh, I think, during the, the uh, Shanghai uh, exhibition, sure. right? You were there and, and you were participating and actually wrote something on that whole experience. I wonder if you could just give us a couple stories along the way of, of, of what, it, what it's like to engage with China. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. Uh, I did a fair amount of uh, work in trade negotiations. In China, government to government work in China. And that can be stilted and formalistic and not terribly rewarding. That's a bit of a grind to try to move trade practices sort of into the modern era. And I think there's been a fair amount of progress, still, still work to go. But for example, when I first started going to China in the first Bush administration, 1992, China was not a WTO uh, member at that point, they didn't even post publicly post a tariff schedule. So you could literally have goods show up in one port and encounter different tariffs than the same goods at a different port. And when you point that out to the customs authorities, they shrug their shoulders and say, that's life. You know, we can charge whatever we want to charge. It's not a public document. At least joining the WTO, the WTO states that, that a country can only enforce tariffs uh, if they're public, if they're published. And it also states there's got to be national standards that are enforced across the board. So at least you start moving toward transparency and consistency in tariff rates. But the, but the negotiations themselves uh, with, with government authorities can be a bit of a grind in, in that system. Uh, I can tell you, though, it's a, it's a delight to be in the private sector in China because you're just interacting with Chinese uh, business people and consumers and staffers and folks on the street. The same way if you were maybe doing business in, in France or Japan or Mexico, I mean, you can have a, a lot of fun. You can make friends. You can really help people out. And it's a great place to run a business. And, and there are rules and there are relationships. And all across Asia, sure. we all know that it's the relationships that ultimately allow us to get things done. Um, you know, how has that changed through the years? Are the rules imposing themselves on those relationships? Uh, a lot of the, uh, the new legislation is cracking down on corruption. Um, people have to kind of stick to the book. Uh, are those this issues kind of con uh, congelling or, or, or creating problems with uh, former relationship driven business? Well, well I, I would I would give this advice, I think, to any foreign business in China. You have a story, and you need to tell your story. And in your home market, uh, there's sort of a presumption there that you're a good guy, that your company has value, that you're hiring people, that you're a good community. 
participant and you, you pay suppliers and you're, you're providing all sorts of economic benefits. And, and people understand this company because it's been around for decades or 100 years. In China, of course, you don't have that reservoir of goodwill. You don't have that familiarity. And you don't always have a high degree of economic literacy. So you need to make sure the different constituencies you work with understand what you're doing and how you're providing benefit to that society. Make sure your goals line up with local political leadership goals so they, they're familiar with what you're doing. Some businesses are very intuitive. I mean, if you're doing food processing or manufacturing apparel or something, people sort of understand that right away. Other businesses are less intuitive, and you really have to explain why, why should an accounting firm, a foreign accounting firm in Shanghai, why would that be helpful to the Chinese? There's all sorts of very good answers to that, but it's not it's not apparent to many people in the Chinese system that you're bringing value. So you have to devote some resources to outreach and communication to make sure all of these constituencies are on board. Are you, uh, in, in the course of building your business and, and engaging with uh, some of the U.S.-based brands, um, what kind of stories have have, uh, have have been conveyed to you about challenges that they've had in penetrating the market or making it work or, or, or reasons for them not to go? Do you have to basically aggressively convince them that China is the market and worthy of their effort? You know, it's what's interesting to me that people's people's appetite for China doesn't have a lot to do with China, but it has a lot to do with the people. So I can talk to two different American firms. They're both women's apparel companies. They're both billion-dollar companies. One company will say, well, we're in 20 markets. The other company say, we're just in the U.S. And they both basically make the same sort of product for the same market segment. And you wonder to yourself, why, why does one company have sort of this international culture and the other company doesn't? Why, why did Philip Knight at Nike 40 years ago say, I've got a global product and I'm going to make this a global success story? I mean, nobody told him to do it, but there had to be some inner fire that prompted him to start going mark to market. So there's not necessarily a roadmap. There's not necessarily a, a trigger mechanism. But some companies just have a forward-leaning culture to say, it's a big world out there. We better start figuring out how we're going to be successful in it, uh, or else the competitor is going to do that. Well, those are the folks we usually end up talking to about China. We can't make you go to China if you don't want to go to China. What we can say is we've got the least expensive and lowest risk way of getting to China. So if you're, if you're looking for new markets, if you're looking for a China solution, we've got some Really interesting ideas. Yeah, I mean, in, in some cases, uh, we've seen contraction. We've seen companies that come to India, China, parts of Asia, and yeah. decide, you know, all things being equal is just too damn difficult. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to, you know, pull back to what I know, and and what I know is 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 the U.S. Is that in, is that indicative of the direction that the world's going? Is no. it just a sign that regulations aren't changing fast enough? Why do you suspect that's no, happening? I, I, I'll tell you, I deal with that a lot, and it's interesting to me that it's it's a company have to evolve from being vertically or organized to being horizontally organized. By vertically organized, I mean these companies have spent their entire existence refining a finite group of vertical capabilities in manufacturing, distribution, finance, personnel, etc. And they've, they've come up with five or six items that they do. They make car parts, and that's all they do. So they've spent 50 years refining that car part production. Then you tell them, by the way, you need to go to China or you need to go to Mexico, and they need to adapt a set of skills that are diagnostic and flexible. What What's the car part market like in Mexico? In what ways is it different? What are, how are consumers different? How do you distribute differently? And some companies have that skill set that they can do the diagnostics, they can make the adaption. Other companies just can't do it. They say, what I've done is take my home market model and I brought it to this new market. I haven't changed anything. So one of our core sayings is China is not just a big Ohio. So if you have a great business in Ohio and you say it's working very well, I'm going to take it to China, you need to have some mechanism to do those diagnostics and understand every element of that business is susceptible to being different. It might be 99% the same, but that 1% change can really mean the difference between profit and loss for your company. So the smarter companies have that capability. It's usually called strategic planning or something of that nature, but it's it's just it's just a sort of a street sense about how how do consumers use this product in China. I'll, I'll give you an example. We worked for a winery in the U.S., a terrific group of people, and they said, let's, let's talk about what we're doing in China. So we had a set of questions for them. L let me just ask you this. In the U.S., how many of your consumers, how many of your customers buy this product for themselves for personal consumption? How many buy it as a gift item? Well, they didn't. They didn't have an answer. That they're they're so product focused that they they made. We thought it was a very good bottle of wine, but to say, yeah, but how does the consumer perceive this? Is this something he's buying because he wants to enjoy a glass of wine, or is this because 
it's a gift. And then we had another set of questions. In China, when do you give wine as a gift? Do you give, uh, do you, does a boy ever give it to a girl? Do you give it to the parents of a girl? Do you give it to somebody uh, when they invite you over for dinner? Do you give it to them? If somebody in your office gets a promotion, do you give them that? In what, in what circumstances is a bottle of wine appropriate as a gift item and what uh, circumstances is it not? I mean, is your competition wine, another bottle of wine? Or is your competition chocolate? Or is your competition a hongbao, a red packet gift? Uh, so what, what are you really selling here? Well, they, they didn't have this. We had to do a lot of diagnostic work for them to help them understand what exactly are you selling. It's more than just a bottle of wine. And, and you've hit on something. Um, the gift-giving culture in China is huge. Um, it's part of the, the tradition, the culture, the, 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 the annual you know, uh, Chinese New Year holidays and celebrations. But there's also been an issue around, again, the anti-corruption drive, where a lot of gifts that were given um, for, for profit are now being curtailed. Uh, in fact, a lot of the golf uh, equipment companies in China have gone through major uh, reductions in sales and, and are even thinking about pulling out to some degree. Um, how does that impact, you know, kind of some of the organizations that you're talking with and their interest in entering the market? Well, one change we've seen in the last uh, two or three years because some of this anti-corruption push is probably less of an appetite for the very uh, high-end luxury items. The Ferraris, the Tiffany's, the Louis Vuitton bags are definitely under pressure. Most of the American retail manufacturers are what we would call premium goods, lifestyle goods, meaning the Nikes, the Disney products, Starbucks coffee. These are what you might call everyday luxury. So they're not really upper end bling. And so people aren't self-conscious or concerned about uh, buying a pair of Nikes. So uh, so it hasn't really hit the mass market, if you will, the premium market, but it has hit that very, very upper end. This is Steve Stein, and you're listening to Inside Asia, conversations with Asia's leading movers, shakers, thinkers, and provocateurs. When we come back after the break, I'll be asking my guest, Frank Lavin, former U.S. ambassador and Reagan aide, now CEO of Export Asia, about the Trump presidency and how changes in the American political landscape might impact what it means to do business in China. Welcome back. My guest is Frank Lavin, and you're listening to Inside Asia. We're talking about the Trump presidency and what that means for trade relations with China. Are you concerned, I mean, during the uh, run-up to the elections, uh, Donald Trump had said something about laying 30 percent tariffs on top of Chinese-made goods. Uh, if, in fact, he makes good on that, are you worried about retaliation and the impact it might have on U.S. Um, uh, US uh, exports to China? Yeah, a- actually, he might have at one point said 45 percent. I think, I think uh, all of China, like all of America, is looking at the new president in terms of what his policies are going to be. We're just not 100 percent sure. Look, there, I'm sympathetic with his points in a general regard, but I'm not as sympathetic on some of the tactics. So, But I'm sympathetic in this point. Look, there's no question there are some real challenging trade practices in China, some of which you could say are non-standard or, or even unfair. There's no question there's a lot of that out there. It's a, it could be a tough market. So I think he's wise to raise this set of issues. Now, is the right response a, uh, a tariff? I, I don't know how that helps us necessarily, but that's what, he, that's what he floated in the campaign. So we just have to wait and see what his approach is. Typically, that does not affect what we're doing. The, the Chinese typically respond with retaliatory measures, but they don't go after branded goods. They'll typically look at U.S. agricultural exports because that's where there's uh, enormous price competition with markets such as Australia or the European agriculture producers. So, so I would expect China, if we put, if the U.S. put some tariffs on some Chinese exports to the U.S., I would expect China to put tariffs on, say, U.S. apples or something of that nature. Are, are you seeing since the election a bit of a wait and see uh, from from U.S. multinationals who may or may not be thinking about uh, increasing their investments or, or their uh, their commitments to China? No, I'm not sure because um, I would look. I've worked in a lot of different markets, and political risk and political changes are always part of. The, the map. And I would not advise companies to base their strategy in any market on sort of the near term politics of that market. The one the one comment I'd make is you need to have the mixture of 
forward-leaning and defensive mix in any market. That, And we would say in China, we're about 80% bullish, 20% defensive, meaning we're, we think the market's going to expand. We we're, we're, know there's going to be growth in China. We know that U.S. brands and products can do very well in that market. But be thoughtful about jolts. Be careful about debt in China and debt service. Be careful about CapEx. Be careful about, uh, about FX and remittance and exchange rates. So there's potential vulnerabilities there that there might be shocks. I think the market adjusts to these shocks, but you don't want to be caught in a, in a vulnerable position. So, so be forward-leaning, but, but be mindful of that defensive posture as well. Yeah, Frank, a little bit, you know, you're compelling. So we're sitting here talking, and you're very convincing. I, I'm, I'm convinced, compelling right? Yeah, yeah, that, well, you, the audience can't see you, but if, if they were here, they'd be impressed. But but I guess, you know, here you are from banker to diplomat to entrepreneur. That's a slippery slope. Yeah. And and yet here I, I hear I hear this wonderful kind of flavor to how, uh, you know, I, I you, you lean into this, you understand the market, you've been around long enough, um, and you are selling it. You are selling China to some right. degree. Right. I mean, how, how does that feel for you over the 25, 30 years you've been doing this. And what what would you be saying to people now about China that you might not have been saying 15, 20 years ago? Well, I, I would tell any young person in America, find some way after college to get to Shanghai, get to Beijing, find some way to to learn and grow there because that it, Shanghai is a city on the move. Shanghai is a hungry city. These are a lot of young folks have not had a great deal of success in their life in their recent family history. For the first time, they're living in a prosperous moment. And and anything is possible in that city. So I would encourage folks in the United States, get, get to China and feel the heartbeat of that city. Yeah, and Shanghai is two and a half, three times the size of New York, isn't it? It's one of the largest cities on earth. Something like 20 it just million, yeah. twenty million just keeps yeah. growing and expanding. So there's plenty of room, or, or in theory, right? right? It just keeps pushing out. But it, it, this almost goes back to your own history: the fact that you know you uh, embraced China and Chinese as a language. And how important now versus twenty five years ago is it to speak Chinese, or is it become a little more, um, uh, you know, global, and that English is more used more commonly than it might well, have been before? Uh, look, I. I think you could have a successful time in China without speaking Chinese, but I would say why not make the journey? Why not start that process at least? Voltaire said once to learn another language, to have another language is to have another soul. But you're you're absorbing the ability to really understand the world from the other person's viewpoint and China's got this extraordinary rich literary tradition, musical tradition, theatrical tradition, uh, amazing dynastic history. So you, you can access it better if you have some language capability. So why not have some intellectual curiosities? You go through life and try to understand not just the business opportunity in front of you, but try to understand the society in front of you. And I think that'll allow it to be easier to make friends and you'll, you'll see greater value in what you're doing. Just as we need to spend more time thinking about and understanding China and, and, and learning the language, if and if, if possible, um, we see now more than ever before more Chinese uh, leaving China, traveling outside of China, being exposed to the way the other worlds work and other economies operate. Uh, to what degree is that impacting their buying or spending behavior? Yeah, I think it has enormous impact. I mean, there's more Chinese now than any time in history who have some kind of international connectivity, studied abroad, worked abroad, traveled abroad. Uh, and that enriches them, and it, I think it helps China move along as well. Also, as you point out, their consumers, when they're overseas, just as much their consumers at home, and sometimes there's a price differential. Sometimes it's just the, the moment because you're on holiday, so you feel like indulging a bit. Uh, sometimes there's the intellectual property benefit that you say, I want, I'm going to go to that main Louis Vuitton store in Paris and, and, and buy something from there. Uh, but, boy, they are big spenders overseas, so you will go into the Tiffany store in New York City and you'll you can run into Chinese language speaking sales clerks right or you can talk to the leading realtors in Los Angeles and they'll have Chinese speaking clerks or you can go to the leading casinos in Las Vegas and they'll have Chinese speaking staff that'll help you get through so the market is responding to this surge in Chinese tourism I uh, spoke with an executive with one of the cruise firms recently and uh, they talked about uh, the enormous rise in, in in Chinese going on on cruises over uh, uh, international cruises and they said unlike with some uh, living in the U.S. or Europe who might go for the relaxation, the sun, maybe even the food, uh, the Chinese go to shop. In fact, retail onboard cruise lines is just off the charts, something in the range of 80 to $100 million per ship per, per day, something crazy like that. 
uh, and I, I, I just that, that boggles the mind. I mean, is is this is there something you know is that in the DNA of the Chinese consumer to buy? You, you know, you uh, you mentioned a minute ago about I worked at the Shanghai Expo, and one of my prides this is 2010 Shanghai hosted the World's Fair, the, the Expo, and I helped chair the U.S. effort there called the U.S. Pavilion. Uh, and one of my projects was I did this souvenir book. I had it signed to make this sort of coffee table book that was a souvenir. And so we're talking through with our Chinese friends and people working with about, well, what's the point of this book and who's going to buy it in China and so forth and where do we want to go with this? It's, it's just sort of a standard coffee table book. And I was told by one of my Chinese friends, look, the entire purpose of this book is so somebody from China goes to the expo, buys this book, and has it on their coffee table. And the entire point of that is so they can tell their neighbors, I went to this and you didn't. So that's the entire sort of marketing gestalt of, of, of this product. So there's a little of that, uh, I think, in the works. Yeah. So, so bragging rights, brand, brand affinities, are they loyal, Chinese customers? Are they loyal to brand? I think they are loyal to brand. They definitely have brand press uh, preferences. There's definitely a status element of that. Uh, the younger people, just as in the U.S., tend to be a little more experimental, want the buzzy brand rather than the established brand. But they'll spend a lot of time saying, what are the uh, celebrities doing? Who in Hollywood? When Michelle Obama gives a speech and they'll know what she's wearing, they'll Google that or use Baidu in China to find that out. And they'll buy that. So, uh, key opinion leaders and video is huge in China. There's a local Chinese variant of YouTube called Yoku, but that's a massive driver of behavior, a lot of uh, live streaming activity, a lot of how-to videos, but you can go to go on to Yoku and watch how people put on makeup, watch how people talk about preparing dishes. Uh, so it's a it's a real driver of consumer behavior. So, so I guess the message here is if, if we've all been thinking about China as this great exporting behemoth and taking away U.S. jobs, we should start thinking about it about one of the greatest and most important uh, export markets for U.S. or other products that we've ever seen. Well, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right, Steve. I'd say this globalization penalizes the, the slow moving companies, but it sure rewards the agile companies. So the company that is not thinking about new markets and not making those adapt not doing the diagnostics to see how it'll work in Mexico or France or China, they're, they're, they're just on the receiving end of new competition. But the agile companies, the Philip Knights, who are saying, you know what, I got to figure a way to make this work, they're, they're doing better than ever. So the Nikes are, are doing great and these global, these global brands are doing great, but it's never been easier for a mid-tier company to start that process now. You don't need to put 30 people into Shanghai. You can just go online in Shanghai and start that process. So my advice is anybody with a brand ought to be thinking about what their international strategy is, and e-commerce is probably the least expensive, lowest risk way of getting to that international marketplace. And what you're trying to say, Frank, is export now. Am I right? Uh, well, I can't think of a better solution. But <laughs> <laughs> look, it's not for any everybody, but for the strong brands, it's really, if we, as we say, if there's magic in your brand, we can make that magic work in China. But if there's no magic in your brand, we can't turn a weak brand into a strong brand in China. And there it is. Is that the diplomat or the entrepreneur? I'm not sure. A little bit of both. Frank, you say, thanks so much for being with us and sharing your thoughts. And uh, we wish you the great, best of luck. Steve, it's been a great conversation. Good luck to you. And thanks for having me on the podcast. That was my interview with Frank Lavin, former U.S. ambassador to Singapore, now founder and CEO of Export Now. For more information about Export Now and Frank Lavin, visit www.insideasiapodcast.com, where you can also download our other episodes and other insights about the Asian marketplace. Until next week, I'm Steve Stein, inviting you to come in from the outside on Inside Asia. Inside Asia.